Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaskar. In this series, our next topic is spirituality. There is importance of religion and spiritual practices for understanding human behavior. This is very important domain where psychologists have emphasized to understand human behavior. Spirituality is a cultural fact and in different cultures it has been observed differently. For example, this study is from America. In Gallup survey by Gallup organization in 1995 and in other researches, it has been observed that the vast majority of Americans believe in God. Number was 95% of the participants, 86% believe that God can be reached through prayers and 86% feel that religion is important or very important to them. So that is why religion and spirituality very important to understand human behavior. Weavers and his associates in 2006 observed studies between 1965 to 2000 and they observed 72 percent rise in the average number of health related research articles published per year dealing with spirituality. When we take into account new researches or new studies, there are various books which are focusing on religion and spirituality. For example, I discussed about this book, Religion and Spiritual Across Cultures and the book provides a review of literature on different contributions of religion and spirituality to positive functioning and well-being. It reviews various religions across the world including Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism, Hinduism, etc. As well as this is a recent book I discussed in previous lectures also, why religion and spirituality matter for public health. So, these all research is showing that religion and spirituality very important domain to understand human behavior. Spiritual practices topped in the list of complementary alternative medicine by patients undergoing treatment for cancer as well as Gallup survey conducted and uh, 1000 people American men and women were studied in this survey. It has been observed that 66 percent of the respondents revealed that they would prefer to receive counseling from a person who shares their spiritual values. On the other hand, as we have already discussed difference between Indian psychology and psychology in India and Indian psychology is based on inner directedness and spirituality and similar kind of books are also published like this book Spirituality and Indian Psychology Lessons from Bhagavad Gita. In this book Professor Bhauk emphasized on the importance of spirituality and stated that with the emergence of positive psychology in the West and the manifold discovery of the impact of psychology in one's life, there is a need to understand spirituality and to use its positive aspects to maintain a balance in hectic modern life. So, there are various researches which are giving importance to religion and spirituality to understand human behavior as well as when we are treating abnormal behavior as well as you know certain diseases. Indian psychology is basically derived from Indian philosophy and religious and spiritual literature. So, again it emphasizes on religious and spiritual literature as well as these domains importance to understand human behavior. Thus, the hallmark to the Indian psychological perspective is inner directedness and spirituality and spirituality is very important domain for us to understand human behavior. On the other hand, when we talk about positive psychology definitions. One of these definitions is positive psychology is the scientific study of optimal human functioning which aims to discover and promote factors that allow individuals and communities to thrive. So, it means along with various other objectives we focus on the factors which promote our well-being and for promoting well-being there could be two type of factors. 
one factors. We deliberately deliver certain intervention modules to promote well being. And in positive psychology, especially in applied positive psychology, we have hundreds of intervention programs through which we have certain sessions and once you experience those sessions, we claim and we observe certain changes in your behavior like changes in your well-being, resilience, emotional intelligence, etc., etc. On the other hand, this is our basic area of research where we are saying that to study existing socio-cultural factors or maybe religious spiritual practices, we may have certain ways to study promotion of well-being. If you know about Delhi and Haryana, people enjoy a day called Ragiri Day. During this period, they dance, they sing, they experience certain other art activities and I think such kind of activities may help to promote well-being. Similarly, in various religious and spiritual groups, they have five to seven days residential programs and these programs are organized by SESMAG, Art of Living Foundation, ISHA Foundation and uh, in some studies or in some cases we have observed that significant changes in their behavior, significant positive changes in their behavior and such kind of studies could be done more. Let us know a little bit more about religion and spiritual what definitions we have and how do we deal with religion and spirituality. Do we count it one or do we count it two separate entities? First point is what is operation definition in our research that is very important point and that is why uh, it applies like other constructs in psychology. You know we have various definitions of various constructs whether we talk about happiness, whether we talk about emotional intelligence, resilience, personality intelligence. So, similarly here there could be various definitions. So, first point is whatever study we are uh, conducting we have to have our operational definition. Second point is are we counting religion and spirituality same domain or we are counting them too that is again very important. Some definitions saying that these are two different, on the other hand others saying that these are sharing significant percentage of variance and quite close to each other. In some studies, religion and spirituality have been used interchangeably. Some psychologists have highlighted certain differences between spirituality and religion. For example, you need to follow a set of rules if you want to move forward in religion. Advancing in spirituality is through a process of loving and accepting yourself and the world around you. Uh, one of the most noticeable differences between religion and spirituality is that religion preaches and commands while spirituality inspires. However, practices in religion and spirituality are highly correlated with each other and that is why in certain studies we are using these two terms interchangeably. When we talk about different definitions, there are various definitions of religion and spirituality. Religiousness is defined as the extension to which an individual believes, follows and practice a religion and usually these beliefs influence how people seek to live out their lives and treat others. As per their definition, spirituality is to seek for meaning in life about the relation with the secret or transcendent and the connection with a higher power or supreme being. So, these way these are two different definitions of religion and spirituality as Cohen and his associates defined in 2012. The term search for the secret is a widely accepted description of spirituality. Religion and religious behaviors represent the many ways in which the search for the secret becomes organized and sanctioned in society. For example, through the attendance of religious services and the frequency and duration of prayer. So, that is why there are various activities done under religion and which are supporting spiritual enhancement or spiritual improvement and that is why both of them are highly correlated. Hill and his associates defined spirituality as the feelings, thoughts and behaviors that arise from a search for the secret. So, like that these are the ways to define spirituality. 
After knowing religion and spirituality and their importance, let us discuss two very significant practices. These practices are yoga and meditation. At least basics of both we should know. Yoga. Yoga drives from Sanskrit word that is use, means union of mind, body and soul. You must be knowing about Yoga Sutra written by Patanjali and he is counted as father of modern yoga. To achieve the harmony of mind, the body and the spirit that is definition of Indian psychology as you know, which leads to samadhi and enlightenment, we follow Ashtanga Yoga. There are eight limbs to understand Ashtanga Yoga. First is Yam. Yam means restrictions. It is your attitude toward others and the world around you. You just see, before understanding oneself, they are giving importance to uh, attitude toward others as well as world around you. And there are various steps uh, under this category, Ahinsa, non-violence, Satya, truthfulness, Asati, non-stealing, Brahmacharya, non-lust, Aprigra or non possessiveness So, these are the steps which one should follow to have high score on Yamas. Second one is Niyam. Niyam means personal disciplines or guidelines, your attitude toward yourself. And under this category, they have identified various practices like Souch or cleanliness, Santosh or contentment, Tapas, austerity or can say Kathor Niyam, Savadhyay or study of the secret text and of oneself. Ishwar Pranidhan or living with an awareness of the divine or devotion to God. These are important steps to have higher level of Niyam. Third is Asanas, yoga positions or yoga postures. Pranayam, yogic breathing is the fourth one. And then next is Pratyahar. This is again very interesting limbs in this series. Withdrawal of senses. Let us understand this concept a little bit more because this is very important to understand connection between external and internal world. Patyahar is built brick by brick through Yam, Niyam, Asana and Pranayam, then utilized in Dharna, Dhyan and Samadhi. So, it is the middle one and it is the fifth petal of yoga also called the hinge or joint of the outer and inner quest as I discussed earlier also. The term Patyahar is composed of two Sanskrit words Prati and Ahar. Ahar means food or anything we take into ourselves from the outside and Prati uh, is a preposition meaning against or away. So, Patyahar means literally meaning is control of Ahar gaining mastery over external influences. It is compared to a turtle withdrawing its limbs into its shell. The turtle's shell is the mind and the senses are the limbs and in this process you just control yourself inside and away from external factors. So, the term is usually translated as withdrawal from the senses but much more is implied and they have discussed various uh, Pratyahara. There are four main forms of Pratyahara. First one is Indriya Pratyahara, control of the senses. Second, Pran Pratyahara, control of Pran. Third, Karm Pratyahara, control of action. And fourth is Mano Pratyahara, uh, withdrawal of mind from the senses. So, through all these controls, we are away from the external world and start to move towards internal world and we learn to withdraw from external world. Then next one is the dharna, concentration on object and then dhyan, meditation and eighth one is the final that is samadhi or salvation or can say mukti. So, these are eight steps which we follow in yoga. And there are various paths or various yogas have been identified in uh, our yogic science like Bhakti Yoga, the path of devotion, Gyan Yoga, the path of knowledge, Raj Yoga, the path of wisdom to self-realization and enlightenment, Yoga of mind we can say, Karma Yoga, the path of action, 
Hatha Yoga, the path of physical self-discipline, Yoga of Will, Mudra Yoga, the path of channeling life forces, uh, Chakra Yoga, the path of energy forces and so on. And there are various other paths or other yogas also. I think uh, there is no need to discuss uh, benefits of yoga. Nowadays, we have more than hundreds research available in the field of, uh, you know, neuroscience, in the field of physiology, in the field of medicine, in the field of psychology. And there are various number of, I think, more than hundreds benefits have been counted there. But still, uh, some of them are like, you know, health, physical and mental benefits of yoga, asanas strengthen the body. Yoga postures regulate emotions and moods, uh, breathing exercise lead to psychological well-being, yoga induces relaxation, yoga contributes to peak psychological experiences, various other psychological and physical benefits are also documented and there are various websites available having all those benefits. So, you could explore some more if you are interested in this field. Next practice is meditation. Meditation is an experience of relaxing the body, quietening the mind and awakening the spirit. The word meditation comes from the Latin word meditio, which originally indicated any type of physical or intellectual exercise. The word med means healing. Meditation increases a deepening of consciousness or awareness and also facilitates a deeper understanding of self and others. There are several meditation techniques that have been developed and practiced for over 5000 years. These specific techniques and skills can be learned and very beneficial they are. If we take only one example, example from Marishi University of Management USA and this data is quite old, I think I took it in 2010 but still it shows its significance. Over 500 studies have been completed on the physiological, psychological and sociological effects of the Maharishi Transcendental Meditation and TMCD program, making it perhaps the most intensively studied technology in the field of human development. These studies have been conducted at 210 different universities and research institutions in 27 countries and articles have now appeared in more than 100 scientific journals. There are number of you know research papers available again showing benefits of uh, meditation from neuroscience, from medical science, from psychology and from all other sciences which could help us to understand human behavior and all other sciences which help us to understand human behavior. Broadly, psychologists have identified three categories of meditations, however, they could be many more, but broadly they have identified meditations in these three categories. Category number one is the focusing, concentrative meditation category. In this category, we focus on single object, breath, a mantra, a single word, a picture or maybe a statue of a deity or the syllable like uh, Om, the famous Hindu mantra may be in this category and we just focus on certain point and it is concentrating in a non-analytic and unemotional way. So, in focusing or concentrative meditation, we learn to focus at particular point or at particular mantra and uh, we just tame our mind to attend whatever we want. Second category is opening up like mindfulness meditation, non-judgmentally to allow stimuli in the internal and external environment, but not to get caught up in or remunerate on any particular stimulus. So, in this category, we may attend various internal and external environmental stimuli, but we are not indulged with them. So, in this process, what is happening? We have disconnected thoughts and emotional reactions. Uh, in ordinary situation, you have certain type of thoughts and these certain type of thoughts are triggering your emotions. For example, if you have positive thoughts, you have positive emotions. On the other hand, negative thoughts triggering negative emotions. But if you are not indulged with these thoughts, then you have not any reaction uh, may be positive or negative. So, we learn to disconnect thoughts and emotional processes and that is why 
there is no impact of these thoughts. These thoughts are coming and going in our mind and we are not indulging or involving with these thoughts. That is why they do not have next processes in our mind. Next category is asking and that is higher level of meditation, contemplative meditation. In this process, we ask some uh, ultimate questions like what is my way, who am I? Enquiry about new understandings and visions and actions we have. So broadly, meditations can be understood under these three categories. Now next point is what is importance of breath in yoga and meditation? For more meditative practices, the breath is very important because it is connected to both the mind and the body. If we are very anxious, frightened or upset, our breath tends to shallow, irregular and quick. On the other hand, if we are relaxed, settled or calm, our breath tends to be more slow, deep and regular. Focusing the mind on the continuous rhythm of inhalation and exhalation provides a natural object of meditation. As we focus on the breath awareness, our mind becomes absorbed in the rhythm of inhalation and exhalation. As a result, our breathing will become slower and deeper and the mind becomes more relaxed and aware. That is why in some meditations, they ask to focus on our breathing. There are various benefits of uh, meditations and uh, maybe you know in hundreds nowadays research paper we have on benefits of meditations. So some of them are the physical, emotional, psychological and spiritual benefits of meditations might include higher level of energy, creativity and spontaneity, lower blood pressure, increased exercise tolerance. They have observed that through meditation we can have better concentration decreased stress, depression, anxiety. It has been observed that fewer cravings for alcohol and cigarettes if we do meditation, increased job satisfaction, better relationship with others we have if we are regular on meditation. We know thoughts, emotions and behaviors are highly connected with each other and uh, meditation is the absence of thinking and it is the process of concentrating the mind. So if we have absence of thinking, it means to some extent we are able to manage or regulate our emotions. Stress management and pain relief has been observed after meditation. Anger management is there, simple way to relax and clear the mind. A control over anxiety, improved awareness and concentration and creates stillness because we are able to concentrate whatever we want, improves our cognition, ability to think and helps us to see things more clearly, develops our sense of self and our spirituality. So these are some of the benefits. However, there are some more researches where they did systematic review and meta-analysis. First of all, before knowing this study, let us know what does it mean a systematic review and meta-analysis. Systematic review answers a defined research question by collecting and summarizing all empirical evidence that fits pre-specified eligibility criteria. It means summarizing all empirical evidences available in already conducted researches for a particular research question. So whichever researches we have on our research question, we just compile all those and try to understand what are the trends in our researches. On the other hand, a meta-analysis is the use of statistical methods to summarize the results of these studies. It means summarizing all empirical evidences by using statistical methods available for a particular research question and conclude our view on the research question as per existing empirical researches. So in meta-analytic research, we do statistical analysis on all those researches which we have compiled on the particular topic. On the other hand, in a systematic review, we just review the existing literatures and we compile all studies results here. So similar kind of systematic review and meta-analytic research conducted by Khori and his uh, 
Associates in 2016 paper was effectiveness of traditional meditation retreats, a, a systematic review and meta-analysis. They reported large effects on meditation practices, on measures of anxiety, depression and stress and moderate effects on measures of emotional regulation and quality of life. As to potential mechanisms of actions, results showed large effects on measures of mindfulness and compassion and moderate effects on measures of acceptance. So, even systematic review as well as meta-analytic research is showing significance of or benefits of meditation. Next topic is meditation and neuroplasticity. Nowadays, this is very important area. Neuroplasticity is a term that is used to describe the brain changes that occur uh, in response to experience. There are many different mechanisms of neuroplasticity ranging from the growth of new connections to the creation of new neurons. A neuroscientist Davidson in 2008 in his article Buddha's Brain, Neuroplasticity and Meditation reported that over the course of meditating for tens of thousands of hours, the long term practitioners had uh, actually altered the structure and function of their brain which supporting connections between neuroplasticity and meditation. So, in modern time uh, scholars, especially neuroscientists claiming that if we are quite regular on meditation, we may have neuroplasticity means changes in our brain structure as well as functions wise. Meditation, spirituality and positive psychology are highly correlated. Mindfulness based meditation interventions have becoming increasingly popular in contemporary psychology. For example, meditation practices include loving kindness meditation and compassion meditation, exercise oriented toward enhancing unconditional positive emotional states of kindness and compassion. Psychology has begun to include and explore a number of exciting new topics like meditation, forgiveness, acceptance, gratitude, hope and love. Each of these phenomena has deep roots in Eastern and Western religious traditions and philosophies. Psychologists are now developing and evaluating a variety of spiritual integrated approaches for treatment including forgiveness, compassion, gratitude, acceptance, meditation programs and the preliminary results are promising. So, next week I will discuss about various interpersonal character strengths like forgiveness, compassion, gratitude as well as their benefits to improve well-being and other human behaviors. So, this section shows us a role of meditation and spirituality to positive psychology and it highlights its importance. Even religious literature as well as uh, you know scholars have identified that this is very important area. As Buddha has mentioned just as a candle cannot burn without fire, man cannot live without a spiritual life and spiritual and religious domain to understand human behavior is really important area. In this series I have included two new and very interesting constructs mindset and grit. Along with well established constructs in positive psychology, positive psychologists are also highlighting and revisiting some new constructs which are significantly contributing to this field. So, let us know what these constructs are, what is mindset, what is grit, how do they relate to each other and how does our mindset affect our behavior. There are various questions raised by Drake and Duckworth and her associates. These questions are what kind of goals do we pursue? How do we respond to failure? Whether we stick to something or give up easily? How much effort do we make to achieve a goal? Whether or not we try new solutions when problems grow up? Whether we have self control and commitment towards our goals? Do we have strong resolution and persistent efforts and interest that is grit's definition. So, they are saying that we individuals are different on all these responses and 
mediating or very strong variables here are what kind of mindset and grit level we have. So, let us know what does it mean when we are saying mindset and uh, you know grit. They also highlighted why the renewed interest in the concept of grit and mindset today. The changing nature of today's society and generational differences are the uh, driving forces behind the recent interest in mindset and grit that was their answer. Today's difficult times can be challenging and stressful for those who have not yet acquired grit trait and developed a 21st century's mindset. They may need to strengthen their resiliency, perseverance and the resolve that is necessary to overcome obstacles, disappointments and setbacks. So, let us understand one by one about mindset and grit. Mindset can be divided in two sections, growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Growth mindset, people with a 21st century mindset believe that they create their own future. Their basic beliefs, values and reference frames are used to organize their world. A 21st century mindset is based on the notion one is always growing and learning and the view one adopts from themselves profoundly affects the way they lead their life. On the other hand, fixed mindset just opposite of it. People with a fixed mindset may believe that heredity, luck and destiny has more to do with creating their future than effort. So, in fixed mindset, you think there are various determinant in your life like heredity, luck, destiny and these all factors have already decided your life. So, you are with fixed mindset and you are not actively progressing in your life. On the other hand, growth mindset, they think they could grow always and every day they are growing. Duckworth and Dwake observed that intelligence and grit, grit means persistent efforts and interest are not traits that one is necessarily born with. These traits can be recognized and developed as well. However, to develop grit, one must hold a growth mindset. So, it means both of them emphasizing that grit and growth mindset are highly correlated with each other. Individuals who have a growth mindset believe talent can be developed through hard work, through mindful strategies and applying feedback from others. They consistently try new approaches and view failure as a momentary setback and an opportunity to grow. So, they have identified difference between fixed mindset and growth mindset. Drake wrote a book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. The view you adopt for yourself profoundly affect the way you lead your life and she differentiate between fixed mindset and growth mindset. Fixed mindset thinks intelligence is fixed, personality is fixed, born with an unchangeable way, born with it and we cannot change it. On the other hand, growth mindset, intelligence is malleable or flexible, personality is flexible and traits can change and be developed. So, with growth mindset, we think we can improve, we are programmed to grow and we should do hard work to grow every day. On the other hand, fixed mindset thinking that we have fixed abilities, fixed personality and we are not able to change much. Through this model, we can learn what kind of mindset we have. There are differences between growth mindset messes and fixed mindset messes. For example, growth mindset, I can learn anything I want to. When I am frustrated, I perceive. I want to challenge myself. When I fail, I learn. Tell me, I try hard. If you succeed, I am inspired. My effort and attitude determining everything. On the other hand, fixed mindset, I am either good at it or I am not. When I am frustrated, I give up. I do not like to be challenged. When I fail, I am no good. Tell me I am smart. If you succeed, I feel threatened. 
my abilities determining everything. So, in this case you could see these are fixed ideas. On the other hand, these are growth mindset and growing ideas. Similarly, another summary between fixed and growth mindset. Fixed mindset ability is static, avoids challenges, give up easily, see efforts as fruitless, ignores useful criticism and threatened by others. And growth mindset on the other hand ability to develop embraces challenges, persists in obstacles, sees effort as necessary, learns from criticism inspired by others success. So, these are the different ways we have fixed versus growth mindset. Persons who have 21st century's mindset they are saying that they have various benefits if they have growth mindset they are more optimist, are always up for a challenge, they identify their own strengths and weaknesses, they believe they are evolving and always have something to learn and lifelong learner they are. Uh, they stress themselves when learning new things. They have the persistence and put in the effort, so that is great characteristic. To learn something over a long time period, try doing things they could not do before. Help you thrive during challenging time, reinforce your belief that you can change and grow, uh, boost your tensity and effort, foster the adoption of great trait and again it shows connection between our very highly correlated grit and growth mindset. Strengthen your resolve when faced with setbacks, challenges and disappointments. Strengthen your resilience, solidify your determinant and effort. Try to be reliable and full committed. So, this is the sources from where I have uh, taken all these benefits of growth mindset. And uh, in terms of growth mindset and achievements, higher achievements, they have given these two steps. Psychologists have also identified correlation between growth mindset and higher achievements. On the other hand, fixed mindset means lower achievements and they are saying that at the time of challenge and failure, how do we move on whether we have growth mindset or we have fixed mindset. With growth mindset increased efforts to achieve those goals and finally, we achieve and that is higher achievement level and it builds confidence and various other positive personality traits in our personality. On the other hand, when we have fixed mindset, then we reduce the efforts because of this fixed mindset and that is why we have lower achievement and this lower achievement again fixed our mindset. So, that is vicious circle and in this case, it is linked with lower achievement as compared to when we have growth mindset which is highly correlated with higher level of achievements. Then Drake worked on how we can change fixed mindset to growth mindset and they have observed various ways of change your words, change your mindset. There are various uh, you know models available on internet, you could explore some more and in all these models they are saying that how we can change our words and by changing words could identify some ways to develop our mindset in growth direction. For example, fixed mindset this is good enough. On the other hand, we can change these words in this term, is this really my best work? I make a mistake, mistakes help me improve, I have some at this, I am on the right track, this is too hard. Change words, this may take some time and efforts. I cannot do French, I am going to train my brain in French, so change the words to have progressive way to learn. Uh, I give up. I will use some of the strategies I have learnt. Uh, I cannot make this any better. Change your words, I can always improve, I will keep trying. I am not good at this. What am I missing? I will never be as good as her. I will figure out what she does and try it. So, they are saying that these are the ways through which we can change our words and by changing our words, we may have growth mindset. Now, in this direction, next construct is grit. 
Angela Duckworth worked a lot on grit, a passionate commitment to a single mission and an unwavering dedication to achieve this mission. Grit is defined as passion and perseverance for long term goals. Grit is the quality of working persistently and consistently toward long term goals despite failures, challenges and highs and lows in the process. Greedy people view success and achievement of goals as a process or marathon and view stamina as their competitive advantages. So broadly, these are two important factors in grit. One, perseverance and second, passion for long term goals. She observed that these are connected terms or highly related terms. However, grit qualities may include but are not limited to and these included terms are self-control or willpower, persistence, tenacity, resilience, hard work, delayed gratification, perseverance, open-mindedness, optimism, conscientiousness, social intelligence, courage. These are the related terms or grit can include these terms. Let us understand this construct a little bit more by the scale which is developed by Duckworth and Quinn in 2009 that is short grit scale and through this scale we can easily identify what kind of questions can test level of our grit. Directions for taking the grit scale are please respond to the following 8 questions or items. Be honest there are no right and wrong answers. So, scales are very much like me 5, mostly like me 4, somewhat like me 3, not much like me 2 and not like me at all is 1. Let us read these questions one by one and uh, two ways you can understand it your level of if you are responding answer of these questions or through these questions you could identify characteristics of a great personality. Number one question new ideas and projects sometimes distract me from previous ones. Second, setbacks do not disgrace me. Third, I have been obsessed with a certain idea or projects for a short time but later lost interest. Fourth, I am a hard worker. Fifth, I often set a goal but later choose to pursue a different one. Sixth, I have difficulty maintaining my focus on projects that take more than a few months to complete. Seventh, I finish whatever I begin. And eighth, I am diligent. You must have observed that these stars items, these are in fact negative items. If you have high score on these items, it means you have lesser level of grit. So, these items should be reverse scored. And after reverse scoring, then uh, your total score must be divided by 8 and that is your score. A range would be 1 to 5. 5 means extremely gritty person you are and 1 is not at all gritty person you are and accordingly you could see what is your score. So, by experiencing the psychological test, you have two messes. One, you could know what is your level on this construct and second through these items or a nature of questions you can understand what do we expect when we are saying your level of gritty and it is highly connected with its operational definition. Now next point here is which is again very important how do mindset and grit relate? You must have observed that these are highly correlated with each other to some extent mindset benefits in terms of grit as well as in grit certain ways where we can say growth mindset is highly correlated. So, mindset is a way of thinking about yourself as a learner and grit is the tendency to sustain interest in and effort toward very long term goals and that is why both of them are highly correlated with each other. I hope you must have enjoyed these two new concepts growth mindset and grit and these are the constructs which help us to have better life. So, I will suggest to practice to have higher level of growth mindset. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.